Hey, hey, pilot wives and fellow aviators, Jackie Elmer here, thrilled to bring you a two-part series where I'm interviewing the author of Highway to the Sky, Lola Reed Allen, and we're going to cover a lot of great topics, including her early days as one of the first female pilots in commercial aviation, or I should say one of the original pioneers back in the 70s, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about her abusive alcoholic first marriage and some tips for navigating that. And we're also going to throw in some travel tips and some advice for what it's like to pursue a non-traditional female type career. If you don't have the Pilot Wife Checklist, make sure you go to pilotwifechecklist.com. Grab that. Now buckle up for part one. Welcome to the Pilot Wife Podcast. I'm your co-captain, Jackie Elmer. I've been a pilot wife for over three decades, and I cannot imagine any other lifestyle. Yes, there's no doubt it's a mix of turbulence and blue skies, but what life isn't? I'm here to bring you the best that the aviation life has to offer. And if you want the Pilot Wife Survival Guide and Checklist, go to pilotwifechecklist.com. Now, Stow your baggage, strap in, and let's unpack the pilot wife life. All right, so today, as I mentioned, we are joined by Lola Reed Allen, author of Highway to the Sky, An Aviator's Journey. And she's a commercial airline transport pilot a flight instructor, a scuba dive master, and an award-winning author and photographer. So she has a range of knowledge that she's going to bring to this conversation. Obviously, we're a more aviation-oriented podcast, but as the Pilot Wife podcast, we have women who deal with all different types of situations, lifestyles, and choices. And so, uh, Lola, thanks so much for being here. I feel like you're great to bring your depth and breadth of knowledge to our audience. Thank you, Jackie. It's a pleasure to be here. And I love talking about aviation and women's roles and women's roles in society and aviation. And we're going to get into so much of that because, um, you know, as you and I were chatting about before we went live, especially once you reach a certain age, around 50-ish, all of us as women have a wide variety of experiences that we can pull from that we have a knowledge base around. And we often undersell ourselves. We don't want to put ourselves out there as some kind of guru or expert. But the reality of it is because of that experience and that depth of knowledge, we have the capacity as mentors, as role models to really uplift that next generation that's coming up and share those experiences. Absolutely right. And that's sort of been my my role. I'm no longer actively involved in aviation, but I still have a license. I still fly. And I decided what I could do and what I wanted to do was um, do an education and outreach um position with uh, the 99s and then with another organization we have in Canada, the the Northern Lights Aero Foundation, which recognizes and um, uh, has a... which recognizes women of who have achieved in aviation and aerospace, and not only do they recognize them, they have they have mentors and uh, awards and scholarships, and it's it's they're both great organizations to belong to. I love that. I'm familiar with the 99s. I love that, and familiar familiar with some of the other ones, but not the Canadian one that you mentioned. So that's right. That's fantastic. Yeah, the other one probably, which I'm sure you're familiar with, is Women in Aviation International, yes. which is an American base. But we, uh, so I'm a member of WAI, but also um, we don't really have a membership, but we're an offshoot, the Canadian Women in Aviation International, and we have our own. Um, annual or semi-annual conferences as well so that's really good but the 99s of course have been around since 1929 um starting with amelia Earhart and 98 other women and today they're let's see about about 7500 women and in about 56 different countries primarily america we have 12 chapters in canada but there's all around the world which is pretty amazing and another big development 
in the in this century really or the latter part of the previous century is the internet whereas before even though the 99s existed i was flying in northern canada and telephones were telephone calls were expensive um the internet didn't exist and yes you might be able to reach out and get help but it would be a very different kind of help you couldn't just pick up your cell phone and you know pm somebody and say oh you won't believe the day i had today so it it makes a big difference we're much closer now because of that isn't it amazing it's, it's it is fun. Okay, so let's dive into your book. And I know one of the things that um, popped out for me is that it was about age five, I believe, when you became familiar with the Golden Hawks. Yes. Um, and so share a little bit about that and your father's experience with the military and aviation. Right. So we uh, lived at the time near Canada's largest Air Force base, which would be Trenton, Ontario. And our house was on the flight path, either from departure or arrivals, obviously, depending on the prevailing wind. And in 1959, um, the uh, Canada started its first um, aerobatic team, which was the Golden Hawks. And they flew F-86 Sabres, which is kind of cool, actually, because Jacqueline Cochran was the first woman to break the sound barrier. That was in 1953. She flew an F-86 Sabre that was actually borrowed from the Canadian military, which is kind of a neat bit of trivia. Um, and so I was pretty excited. You know, they'd be flying overhead and, you know, there's a beautiful gold color that shone in the sun. And I, you know, was jumping up and down and I kind of said, wow, that'd be so much fun to fly. And, you know, I want to be a pilot. My parents didn't really say anything then. They didn't say, yes, that sounds fabulous. They just didn't really say anything. They were very reticent about any kind of a comment. But a couple of years later, after the birth of my only sibling, um, we decided, or they decided, that they would fly out west from Toronto to Regina for um, a, a, an annual um, family reunion. My dad was from that area. And it was exciting, to say the least. We couldn't go nonstop um, because we were flying turboprops um, with, I think, a max passenger capability of about 100 people. So we flew from Toronto to Winnipeg, had a layover, not for refueling, but to get on an even smaller uh, turboprop, which I think was about 48 passengers. And it was August, late August, and it would be Canada's equivalent of hurricane season, right? We had lots of thunderstorms, big, massive thunderstorms. It was rough, rough, rough. And I was having a great time. It was memorable. It was like a ride at the fair. My mother, meanwhile, was chain smoking, vomiting. <laughs> she was not having a good time. Anyway, so I said some kind of comment like, oh, when I grow up, I want to be a pilot. And my dad said, and this is based on his own problems, what he, what he could have said that would have been somewhat encouraging would have been, well, you know, that's a really great idea and flying might be fun. There aren't many women that fly. In fact, I only remember seeing some in the military during World War II. What he instead he said was, don't be silly. Girls don't fly airplanes. Like very dismissive, um, very negative. And that I later learned, much later, when I took him for uh, a flight in um, a Cessna 150 that my my husband and I bought Um and my father was sort of sitting there the whole time, like grumpy, and he didn't want to look out the window. And uh, he, I realized from an ensuing conversation with my aunt, as well as my mom, really, that dad had 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 wanted to be a pilot during World War II, which probably isn't surprising. Probably every every male who signed up for the military around the world regardless of what side you were on, wanted to be a pilot. Anyway, he was a very bitter person and he'd had several ear infections as a child. He had hearing loss, complete hearing loss in one ear. So obviously he wasn't going to be able to fly. He became an aircraft maintenance engineer, which I thought was pretty amazing. Later on in the book, I date an engineer and he's, he's awesome. But to dad, you know, in his eyes, I guess he was a failure and to have his only child uh, sorry, his only child, but his his first child become um, pilot that he wanted to be but couldn't. Uh, I guess it was a really bitter pill for him to swallow. So there's a bunch of other emotions wrecked in there too. Um, they didn't really want kids, but you know when you get pregnant in the 50s and 60s, you don't. Even if you might have taken all the precautions possible, you don't really have a lot of choice. 
un, or you didn't really have a lot of choice unless there was some kind of obvious medical issue affecting the mom or the mom to be and uh and the and the fetus so i was born and obviously i'm glad about that but um and they were wonderful parents but they weren't loving parents so when i say wonderful they were good to me you know did all the things that parents are supposed to do you know figure skating ballet tap that kind of stuff none of which i was very good at but you know they were great they took me to all these things um you know we went on family holidays we went on airplane flights i mean flying in 1962 you know you take everybody schleps their kids around it today like they're getting on the bus well then you got all dressed up in your poshest frock possible and it was not like taking the bus or the train it was it was pretty special to say the least yeah, I remember yeah. my first flight in the early 70s. And yeah. my mom took a shopping for brand new clothes to fly on oh. the airplane with. I mean, we, nice. were, we were dressed up. So, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, I, I, oh. I confess that when I see someone getting on a plane looking like they literally just rolled out of bed, it's like, you know, you don't have to wear a posh frock anymore, but maybe you can comb your hair. I don't know. Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm with you. I kind of still dress. And a lot of that probably comes from my years, decades in the airline industry of having to wear nicer clothes to fly yeah. space available, you know, as a non-rev. Um, and yes, even absolutely. everything is relaxed so much. My mindset around that still is, oh, I got to, I got to be dressed nice. Else they might not put me in first class or they might not put me on. And even though that's gone, it's might like, not put you on the plane. Yeah, well, that's right. 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 That's right. right. No, so that's true. Like if you're deadheading, you have to wear a uniform. And right. if you're non-ref, I mean, you're representing the company. And it's, right? Makes sense. Yeah. Or a company, since you might be on a on an associate carrier. But still, yeah. Yeah. Do you think, or had did you ever have a discussion? Do you think your father might have felt differently had you been a boy? Had you been a son? Might he have felt differently about your decision and felt instead of a jealousy maybe a mix of jealousy and pride had had you been the son and gone on to fly? Maybe that question. I've never considered it. No one has asked me. It's a really good question. I, I, I think perhaps, but I wouldn't say conclusively. He was from a family of eight and he was forced to, as so many people were, at grade 10, he quit high school. He was forced to quit high school and go to work to support the family. And in his mind, it wasn't his family. Yes, they were his siblings. But again, this comes from, you know, I mean, how old are you in grade 10? I don't know, 14 or 15, maybe. And he probably didn't understand all the, the ramifications of having children in the 1919s or in the teens and the 20s, right? But he may have. Um, he was good to my son, so it's certainly possible, but generally he didn't like kids. So if I had to guess, I'd say no <laughs> in his particular case, but that's a good, good question. And I think a lot of fathers, um, might feel that way. You know, you have, that's an unfortunate part that we're still dealing with is that there's still the social expectations of behavior and dress and career that are not entirely and certainly not by everyone in North America or the world, but there's still that kind of a priori thought that, you know, your daughter might get an education and maybe should get an education, but will still be a mother and a wife. And we don't always have that same expectation for, for our sons that they will necessarily get married and necessarily have children, but we do expect them to get a job, have a good education and get a job. And, you know, you can go shopping at, you know, Walmart or any of the big department stores, any store, and you still get little frilly pink, now it's ballerina tutus for the girls and trucks for boys. And I, I think the ballerina tutus are pretty cute, actually. But um, there's still that underlying assumption that little girls should act and behave differently than little boys, which I never believed in ever, ever, ever. I played in the sandbox never played doctor and nurse, but played in the sandbox with the boys. They were the ones in the neighborhood. So I played with them. I was the same. I had a total mix, complete mix of rough it up, riding bikes, swimming in the river, playing in the mud, all that kind of stuff, as well as my next door neighbor, you know, 
we did play Barbies a little bit in her camper trailer in the summers that was sitting you right. know, outside. So I had a definite mix of both. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Captain Barbie. I don't know if you can yeah. see there. That's probably better. Yeah. And this is the kind of toy we need. I love Barbie and, you know, and Ken and all those people. Um, but yeah, this is what we need. Captain Barbie or um, pharmacist Barbie or veterinarian Barbie or astrophysicist Barbie. We need more of those rather than, or as well as little frilly party dress, you know, glamour Barbie um, or wedding dress Barbie, whatever. Well, it is funny. I know just even, it was probably about two years ago, I was speaking with my father, who's almost 92 and still living, gratefully, and my mom as well. Um, We were talking about uh, a doctor, a new doctor that he had seen and blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, what did he advise you? And he goes, well, actually, it was a she. And I thought to myself, oh, "Oh my gosh. Right. I, I was so ashamed of myself for automatically defaulting to a male. Interesting that you should say that. And it's true. And our language does inform us. So on a, a, a compilation of data from 1960 to 2021 that was produced um, using FAA, so Federal Aviation Authority Statistics, not Canadian, but it was compiled by Jenny Beattie, who is a retired um, airline pilot in America. And what I, know I noticed... Is. Yeah. Yeah. What I noticed was it was credited to airmen statistics faa in canada we have pilot license whether it might be an airline transport pilot license or a commercial pilot license it's not gender specific uh gender neutral but in america you still get an airman license which wow our, our you know we don't call it fire we don't say firemen or policemen um, garbage man, whatever you don't, we don't say that anymore at all. It's right out of our, for the most part. Um, but yeah, it is easy to lapse into that. He, uh, unless you're really consciously thinking about it. Well, and it's funny cause I've had a female doctor for years myself intentionally, like very intentionally <laughs> because it's like, right. It's kind of like taking as a woman going to the car mechanic where they kind of look at you like you're crazy. And it's like, oh man, it sounds like this. Oh, I can't hear anything. It was kind of the same for me with the doctor. I was like, you know, we're built differently. I don't care what Mm. anybody says. There are certain things. And I want to go to a woman where I can say, I'm feeling this or I'm feeling that or whatever. So the fact that I just popped up with that, and that was just purely conditioning, you know, just constant. I mean, for years, that's all we saw was a white yep. male in a white lab coat and that was a doctor and that was authority and that's what we listened to. Um, so it is, yeah, it's it's very, very interesting. Very interesting. And it's easy to do. I mean, I, I'm guilty of that too occasionally, but I try to really think about it. Um, but we do have to make a conscious effort to change our, um, our thoughts, our perceptions, and then how we verbalize those thoughts and perceptions as well. Even though, as you say, I have a female doctor too. Yeah, not usually. So. I've never, I never had a female doctor um, who was a civil aviation medical examiner, but I, I have had several female doctors, and I personally haven't found any difference. But maybe I've just had some really awesome male doctors um, in the last twenty six years. I may also have been treated slightly differently because my husband is a physician, and everyone knows that I married to a physician. So you, there may be a little bit of difference there too. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so said, let's move on to um, you. So your dad said that way back, girls don't fly. And then um, did you just kind of tuck that away? Because then you went on, you did not follow aviation to begin with. Right. Share a little bit of, of that story. And then you married, and then we'll move into your aviation career. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I even in high school, I by that time, I was feeling kind of defeated Partly I realize now it was because my parents were having their own troubles, marital troubles. But my mother early on at one point, probably more than once, but I do remember when I was 16, she said, Lola, you know, you've got to start bucking the system. Your life will be so much easier if you don't, you know, always challenge everything. Um, and, and she was right, but I didn't listen to her. And I, I think I've still had a wonderful life, even though I've spent a lot of time challenging everything, I guess. Um, 
But in high school, I, I wanted to take shop. I couldn't. I was told, again, girls don't fly. Girls don't fly. And they also don't take shop. Um, they need to take home ec so they can learn to cook and sew. And because their husbands, as I was told, my husband would really appreciate someone who could cook and sew. Never mind that I already knew how to do that because my, my mom and my grandmother had, had taught me. So girls today can take shop, which is really good. But, you know, that combined with the media... And also my somehow subconsciously, I realized there was something wrong with my parents' marriage. And I was really, really needing a, a companion. I wanted to be loved. Um, during this time, it, it, I really do need to say, though, that my grandparents were, were absolutely wonderful and, and were sort of the stand-in parents uh, from an emotional standpoint, at least. At any rate, so I met Paul, and he was like so totally different than anybody I'd ever met. Tall, gorgeous, like very sculptured, but Scandinavian sculptured, gorgeous, and uh, an athlete um, who taught downhill skiing and water skiing and hang gliding and a really exciting personality. Um, later, a little too exciting. Um, but uh, <laughs> when alcohol began to really get the best of him. And uh, so as our marriage was collapsing, he, uh, he he was great. He was trying to find ways to to bring us back together. And, and his dad uh, had a private pilot's license and his father's brother, so his uncle, in other words, excuse me, also had a private pilot license. Between them, they had three airplanes. And so he had this, he, my husband had this great, two great role models that he knew he could fly because his dad did. And his dad had always flown. And so he came home one day and suggested we take flying lessons. And honestly, I thought he was crazy. I would kind of abandoned, I'd really abandoned the idea as, as futile, uh, for several reasons. It's pretty expensive. I did have a good job with the Bank of Commerce, so I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't feeling any real need, even though I wasn't that terribly happy with the job. It, it paid reasonably well. Anyway, and I also didn't even know where to take flying lessons. And keep in mind, we don't have the internet. You know, you, you had to do a big, deep search, and make a lot of phone calls to find anything. But he'd been driving past uh, in the farm, area where we lived and he drove past this little airport and he said oh i already booked this familiarization or fan flights for us tomorrow i was like what? my gosh because i thought where are we going to go flying you know so there's there's the exposure to big airports but in my mind i was pretty sure you didn't go flying at a big airport again i didn't know any pilots the only pilots i'd ever seen were were military and men um so Really, I'd, I'd sort of bought into that. And that's why I feel so strongly now about being out there and going to the schools, um, doing podcasts like this, uh, talking to service clubs. And yes, many people who belong to service clubs are older, but they have relatives. They have daughters. They have granddaughters and sons and grandsons. So there's lots of people who, you know, to spread the word. And it, and, and I'm usually very well received. And, and they they realize that, Women have been flying a long time, but not commercially. And that's really the big issue, flying commercially. At any rate, we took flying lessons. I was more than overwhelmed. And probably, though I can't really say when I thought, wow, this is the greatest thing ever. Um, but our first flight was March 17th. And by July 1st, I had my private pilot license. So at some point in that very short time period, I thought, this is it. I really, really love this. And I, the next year I got my commercial license. Um, I think less than a year, it was in March, but I think it was less than a year from when I took my very first flight in which I was, didn't want to take control of the airplane even. And I quit my job and said, that's it. I'm going to, I'm going to go fly, uh, fly commercially. And I got my instructor rating first. And are you still married at this point? And how did he pursue the flying part of it? Or did you, or were I, you the he, only one? No, he pursued flying. Um, so we both started in a small town in southwestern Ontario. We were driving up to our up to our family cottage, his family cottage, for holidays. We promised ourselves that we would use this as family time to kind of you know try and get back together, and or but we had to drive past the airport, uh, the Muskoka Airport, 
and it's a huge airport. You couldn't possibly miss it if you tried. And we said, oh, let's just go in and take a look. Anyway, I think the next day I was uh, up in the air um, taking flying lessons. So for those next two weeks, I flew most days and finished my flight training. So I got ahead of him there. And he was wonderful during our holidays. Didn't drink very much. Um, was really, I mean, he was really a wonderful he was a wonderful guy and a great dad and a great provider, but he also was an alcoholic with some some demons, and they seemed to surface after our our only child was born. So the day after I got my flight, I passed my flight test, and then we went back to work. And um, he made me very angry that day, and I said, "That's it, I'm leaving you." And I, it was just flying. I guess was so empowering. I'd been wanting to leave him. I'd been wanting to have a discussion. I really didn't want to make him angry. That you know was, might be counterproductive for my health, shall we say? Um, not that it would be my fault that he hit me. I want to emphasize that. But making someone angry uh, who has a bad temper and is you know doesn't want you to leave. Anyway, um, he did take it quite calmly at that point, um, but said very negative things like, oh, you'll never make it on your own. Um, you'll never leave me. Um, but I did. And it was for the better. It's one of the main reasons that I left him, not just for my own personal uh, mental well-being, was for the safety of our son, who was now age three. And he, I didn't want him to see the bullying. And that's really what I think I would describe my husband's behavior at that point as bullying. You know, if, you know, he'd stand, I mean, at six foot two, big athletic, marvelous shoulders, you know, great, you know, great physique, but having that stand over you with an angry face and angry fists, you know, doing this, um, even if it's just to him, you know, you get the message pretty quickly. And I, I just didn't want our son to to internalize that as as normative behavior and it, it seemed to work i think um he treated he my ex-husband treated his next his next two wives that sounds really bad but unfortunately the next one died after a few years from uh um from illness which was tragic because if i'd had to interview someone to be a nanny for our son i would have picked her she was awesome awesome so i was very fortunate that way um yeah so unfortunately instead of bringing us closer together it did split us apart but it was the flying that did it that finally and i figured if i could fly this airplane i can do this i can do almost anything because it was now something that i wanted to do thought i'd never be able to do it and yes is it is expensive but it isn't any more expensive than um, several years at college or a university education. Yeah, it's interesting. A, a word that I've always associated with aviation, which maybe these pair together for you too, is the word freedom. I know, and I've never been a pilot. I've worked almost every other aspect of the airline industry. Um, I've even gassed an air, fueled an airplane and washed a windshield right. along with everything <laughs> else. Um, well, that's but awesome. <laughs> Yeah, it is. I, I feel like I have such a well-rounded vision of the of the of the yeah. structure of it, sales and marketing, all of that. But I know for me, even to this day, I still get that little butterfly feeling in my stomach every time I fly. I'm almost always glued to the window seat, and there's a sense of freedom from the time you know, we're roaring down the runway to take off. Oh, yeah. There's the freedom of flight. And I did have the opportunity to fly with a good friend in a private pilot, private jet once. And he brought me up front and I, I just Ooh. remember that feeling of sitting out there and we were at 40,000 feet at that point and just the sky. And I just remember thinking, wow, like, I, I mean, that, that doesn't even describe it as you well know, just that feeling of gliding up there, pure freedom. I can yeah. only imagine how a bird feels. So I wonder if that sense of freedom that flying gave you also gave you that courage to pursue freedom in other areas. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was empowering. Uh, and yes, absolutely. The, the feeling of freedom, the realization that I, I liked marriage, but not to this man. And it's, it's, I mean, it's not, you don't really feel weightless and yet 
you do. It's sort of like flying along on a magic carpet, um, and especially so when it's you know smooth. And I mean, the day that I did my private pilot flight test, or the day was it, it was it was epic. It was just so beautiful. You know, we went in and the clouds were horrible, and it wasn't it wasn't a flight. It was a flyable day, but it wasn't a flight test day. You know, I did an hour or so on the ground doing you know the ground briefing, air regs, air navigation. You know, the navigation. We come out in the just absolutely spectacular clouds, um, a little bit of scud cloud, you know, low, but beautiful high cloud and the sun was shining around them, you know, glistening and gilding the edges of the cloud and then taking off. It was just, it was just spectacular flying among the cloud. And I think... As a, I, I know that as a child, I loved watching the clouds and looking at the different shapes. And I was fascinated. Sometimes, you know, there's different cloud layers at the different levels. And so they'd be going, you know, at, at opposite angles to each other. And, you know, as a six-year-old, it's like, wow, what's going on up there? Or if the clouds were moving really fast, my I, I, as a young, young child, I remember thinking, wow, the earth is really spinning fast today. I wonder what's going on. And of course, it was the, the clouds just moving super fast at, you know, 60 knots or whatever. But um, I think it's the clouds just being up there near the clouds. Um, that's still one of my favorite things to do is sort of cloud surfing. And I think a lot of pilots really like doing that too. You know, you're descending and you're Going, going to descend through the cloud, but for a while they're just flying above the clouds. It's sort of like, it doesn't feel the same, but it's like being in a, a speedboat on the water and the, the waves are going by you. Yeah. But okay. I also like takeoff too. It's so Oh, I fun. do too. I, I love all of it. I really do. It's like, oh, here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, I want I want to backtrack, deviate, if you will, um, get off course a little. Good Easy. point. Lingo. No, um, Perfect. I want to come back to the um, abuse and alcoholism. And the biggest part of that, my largest audience are women. Um, and many of them have experienced that, are experiencing that, and especially the alcoholism piece of it. Because as a society, as you know, and especially if you're a drinker yourself, to any extent, um, yeah. we celebrate alcohol. It's part sure. of everything. It's a part of our entire culture, all of that. And sometimes I think that there can be a tendency to overlook some of the signs of early alcoholism when is a little too much or whatever it is. So share with us a little bit about your experience with that. And at what point you realized this is a problem mm. and, and what advice you might have for women who are in that same situation, watching a partner, a spouse. Right. Well, I, I met my husband when I was 19, nearly 20, but 19, and we fell in love immediately. And we were both uh, working at uh, at a ski hill. It was the summertime, but then we worked at the ski hill. And it was very normal, as you say, to celebrate with alcohol. So after a day on the ski hills or after a day teaching water skiing, we'd we worked at, at a hotel area, a ski hill area with a hotel. So we'd go to the hotel, you'd have a drink, you'd go to the bar, have a drink, two or three, whatever. And it was very normal. So I had a I hadn't been exposed to going to a bar before, really. Um, I mean, I did, of course, but not not as a, oh, hey, you know, we're done. You know, let's just ski down into the bar. That I hadn't been used to that. But everybody was doing it. So it seemed very normal. So that was, I, I think then he probably was a burgeoning alcoholic. It wasn't until later and after we were married that I learned he'd had a drug problem, uh, which in the, the late 60s or early 70s wasn't anything like the opioid problem today but it, it was minor uh but he he didn't he wasn't doing drugs then and we didn't do drugs then um but there were little things like he would get he would drink more than others i was actually warned and i mentioned it in the book that there was a, a friend of ours a mutual friend another ski instructor uh who who suggested that paul drank too much and I just sort of thought he was kind of jealous or something. And I didn't, I didn't really listen to him. So I guess that's number one, listen to your friends. Maybe they're on to something. But in my mind, where I had grown up, I associated alcoholism with the 
basically, I guess we would call them homeless today. So if you went downtown on a Saturday morning, and I did often to go to the library, I'd see drunks laying on the ground and they were dirty. They were basically unkempt and they smelled of alcohol. So that to me was an alcoholic. And it didn't even occur to me until much later uh, that my husband was an alcoholic. Um, it's hard to say. My current husband, he has a couple glasses of wine every day at night when he comes home. I actually don't think he drinks any more than my alcoholic first husband, but the reaction is different. So my current husbands, hopefully forever husband, um, will, his personality doesn't change. That's another clue. If your personality changes, maybe if you're slightly happier or slightly more gregarious, that's not what I'm talking about. Usually it's nasty and mean, very, very different personality, sort of like a Jekyll and Hyde personality. So if they turn into, um, is it Mr. Hyde when they drink? That's a clue. If they're a little bit more possessive than normal or start suggesting you should wear different clothes. And I'm not talking about, hey, honey, this is a formal dress and you're not wearing something appropriate. I'm talking about you wear this because I think it's in a, you know, you, or you can't wear this because you're showing too much flesh or whatever. Something that's really restrictive or restricting your movements, Um not letting you work is a big one. That's a little bit, I'm not sure that happens today. I suppose it does. Um, and other insidious things. So we were actually at the um, out, for, out for drinks a few um, weeks ago it, locally. It was still summertime. It was lovely. We went to hear a live band. A friend of ours was in the band. We went to hear him perform. And we ran into a few friends. It was just my husband and I who, who went alone. And we ran into a couple friends. So the First couple, we'd know we knew we've known them for a long time, but mm, very little. They stopped by our table and we're chatting, and um, everything in, in previous conversations, he'd done most of the talking. Well, in this one, she was actually very chatty and friendly, but everything she said, he was he interrupted her he talked over her i mean everything not just hey honey wait 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 you know nothing like a normal interruption he talked over her he criticized her he belittled her she was telling me about this house that she bought and he said oh that dump and she said well i was 21 and i was really proud it was my first house i was really impressed so i kind of you know built that up because i was thinking this is the weirdest dynamic now i would consider her an abused woman now, he doesn't come home, hopefully, presumably, I guess, I'd like to hope, he doesn't come home and, you know, beat the crap out of her, but he's certainly verbally abusive and not a nice person. Well, it wasn't, it, it, the evening just got weirder as far as I'm concerned. Another man came up who knew this couple and we're chatting and then, then this man said, oh, wait, we know each other. He was another pilot that I'd met a few years ago. And his uh, his now wife was a friend of mine. And he said, oh, I'm going to tell Susie to come talk with you. That seemed pretty normal, right? Susie, a few minutes later, Susie comes over. We're having quite a chat uh, about aviation. And uh, but during the next 20 minutes or half an hour, he came back four times to tell her to go talk to someone else. And I also consider that abusive. So just over controlling, I mean, sure, we all make suggestions to our partners, right? You know, gee, honey, that shirt does not match those pants. That's a different thing than, than you know, you're trying to help your husband by color matching or, or plaid and print matching or whatever. That's a different thing. And then, of course, the violence, that's so so obvious. I mean, it's, it's hard to escape, uh, hard to escape noticing. It's also hard to escape because you're thinking, at least I was, and I was right. Um, if I leave at some point, he's probably going to get violent. And he did. I thought I dodged that bullet, but I didn't. Um, so you need a lot of support network. Um, in 1979, when I left my husband, that was pretty radical as well. Um, women did occasionally leave their husbands. That same year, Farrah Fawcett left Lee Majors. Um, I don't know if he was abusive or not, but she just decided she wanted to be on her own. My grandmother, her best friend also, so my grandmother was born in 1904. So at some point in the 1940s, that woman left her husband because he was a violent or abusive alcoholic. Interestingly enough, because of that, she had the support of her parents and his parents. 
So that was pretty unusual. So, I mean, there were precedents. Women did leave husbands, but very rarely. And I was censured for that. One of the guys I flew with said, how come you can't keep a husband? It's like, what, what, what makes you think he left me? Well, it's like, you know, like you didn't leave him, did you? Surely not. I mean, why would a woman leave a man? Right. Interesting. Yeah. So it was, there are lots of little clues, um, but restrictive, verbally abusive is, is a good one to start with. Although, my first husband was not verbally abusive. So I guess maybe the biggest one is personality change. That's so obvious. And yet it's it's time to get out, by the way. Leave then. <laughs> also, have a job. Have a, have a network that you can rely on. Maybe your parents, maybe not. Maybe friends, relatives. But if you have an education and a job, which I did, I had a car, an education. I just needed to get an apartment and a little bit of furniture. So, and then negotiate our child custody. But by that time, we were getting along well enough that um, it worked out okay. Because he was a reasonable man. Right. Just Ultimately. The other side. So mm -hmm. what was it like then? I mean, that was, that was a time when certainly women weren't that common in aviation, but being a single mom and a flying career, how did you navigate that? Because even today, I know that can be a challenge with childcare. <laughs> and I mean, I can only imagine being a mom myself, not in that situation, but you know, it seems like you're constantly feeling guilty. Like mommy guilt is just part of being a mom, Sure, but I can yeah. only imagine the stress of, you know, childcare and all of that. So Talk to us about how you navigated that back in the well. Late sometimes 70s. I did it well. Sometimes I did it well, and sometimes I didn't do it well. Um, there's a, a section in the book where I meet this guy, and he's a great guy, and he's a pilot as well, and he's a, he's a lovely human being, and he adores my son. And now we're, we're my husband and I are separated, um, and had been for about a year, I think. And he seemed like a great guy, and he was a great guy, but he kept saying. And I don't blame him. I don't blame anybody. He kept saying, you know, you know, if we move in together, it'll be so much easier for you. Um, I only work three days a week, you know, 12 hour shifts. Um, and he had a good job. Um, you know, I'll be home more often. We'll be able to see each other more often. It'll be easier for childcare. And he was absolutely correct in all those factors. But because I was still so vulnerable and and it was difficult wow oh my gosh childcare was very difficult um but you know I, I did have nannies but anyway we wound up living together and he was right it was much easier but i wanted it to work for our son my son um and he was such a great surrogate dad and even after i broke up with him um and he was really angry and hurt and it's probably the only thing i really really truly regret i mean i've done some stupid things but i really regret it regretted breaking up with him uh because he did love our my son and he was great and he still wanted to see him afterwards which was amazing on the other hand i was also very fortunate to find great um a great 16 year old who also became a 17 year old and an 18 year old but a great 16 year old who when i was on overnights uh she would come and stay at the house of the apartment in that case, um, which was great. And she loved my son. And um, after a while, she said, you know, I'm an, I'm an okay cook, but my mom's really good. Could I take um, your son to, to mom's house? And the parents were lovely. And then it was like, well, you know, why don't we just stay overnight? So it was really awesome. So he had sort of like this second family um, and a big sister, which was, which was really gratifying. And my ex-husband was also very supportive in that we had joint custody. Also, also unusual, I didn't request alimony. I said, I want out of this marriage. I don't want alimony. Child support is good. But we did the way we did child support was um, as he got older, our son got older, he would spend the school year since we didn't live in the same town, like, let's make this as complicated as we possibly can. Um, he'd, he'd, he'd go to school year, go to school with in where my husband lived and spend all holidays with me. So summer holidays, all school holidays, Easter, Christmas, whatever. And during that time, whenever, whenever our son was with 
whoever my, our son was with, that was who was responsible financially. And it was occasionally a bit difficult because my husband did earn more money than me. I won't complain about what I was earning, but he did earn more money than me. So we did that flip flop for several years. And then as our son got older and really needed to be at, at high school in one school, um, and one school district even. Um, and by this time, my husband had remarried to this wonderful woman who I would have picked as a nanny. And they said, you know, well, how do you feel about Brandon staying here all school year and you have him throughout the summers and all the other vacations? And it, it was kind of hard, but it was also easier and it was definitely better for him. So even though I picked the wrong man, ultimately he was such a great dad, it worked out. Thankfully, well, very good. you know, I mean, life's a journey and, and I tend to believe there are no mistakes. It all takes us to the next spot. So the next it does. Place it, is to be okay. So now that I've teased you with part one, make sure you circle back around and listen to part two. Do you ever find yourself on the struggle bus with relationships, career, or life in general? I'm a mindset and peak performance coach, helping women rediscover their own sense of identity and purpose, avoid turbulence, and put their own oxygen mask on first. Together, we work to get you out of autopilot and create a better flight plan for life and relationship success. As a pilot wife for over 30 years, I've navigated thousands of miles and moments in aviation, mommyhood, business, and life in general. I would love to offer you a free call to see if I might be able to help you too. You can go to coach.pilotwifepodcast.com. And if you have a topic suggestion or a story to share on the show, go to ask.pilotwifepodcast.com. And of course, you'll find all of this at resources.pilotwifepodcast.com. Please take a moment to review and rate the show on whatever your favorite podcast app is. This helps the show get found by others who need what we have here. And you might win some fun swag for your troubles. I'll see you on the journey. And thanks for listening.